Hello there and welcome to this episode of Altitude, our monthly look at the world of aviation and air traffic control. My name is Andy Dolan and I'm extremely pleased to be back here in the hot seat for what is going to be a very exciting topic. Every year, millions of people around the world flock to air shows to marvel at the very best pilots flying the most iconic aircraft. But with the Royal International Air Tattoo, or RIAT, happening at Far uh, Fairford in just a few days now, what does it take to plan, manage and safely deliver a truly spectacular air show? The tower at RIAT is made up of volunteer controllers from all over the UK who work incredibly hard to make the show a safe and exciting experience for the thousands of people who attend. But that work starts long before the doors open to the public. The work involves coordinating with the CAA and the military, and it's all overseen by a cuddly badger. More on that later. With me to take you behind the scenes are two of those volunteers who also happen to be my colleagues at Heathrow Tower. Firstly, the Oracle of Airshow Knowledge and Deputy ATC Manager at Riyadh, Adam Spink. Hello, Adam. Hi, AD. How are you? Very good, thank you. And we're also joined uh, by a Riyadh trainee uh, who's also a Heathrow ATC Watch Manager in his spare time. It's our very own Maverick, the incredible Toby Gowman. Hi, Toby. Afternoon, AD. How are you? Very good, thank you very much. So before we get excited about Ria, let's just find out a little bit about our esteemed guests. So Adam, welcome back. You've been on a few shows now and I have the absolute privilege and delight of working with you on a daily basis. Uh, for, for the benefit of those people watching and listening, just give us a bit of background about your ATC career and how you then ended up being involved at Ria. Yeah, of course, Adi, and uh, yeah, good to be back on on the show. Um, so I've I've been working at Heathrow Tower now for about twenty three years, maybe a bit more, twenty four years. Um, came into it straight from school, um, didn't go to university, um, and then you know after a few years at Heathrow, just thinking what else is out there for a challenge. And uh, I've I've always loved air shows, been you know go to many every year. And um, Riyadh is obviously the the most famous and uh, and biggest that I've been to, and um, you know I started to think, oh, I could, you know, maybe I could see about working Riyadh. Because once you get behind the scenes of something, it's it's far more interesting. You know, uh -huh. a lot of people just see aircraft flying around, and there's just so much more, which hopefully we'll get into uh, in the course of this show. And um, it was 2015, I think. Uh, a few of us went down to visit during one of the arrival days um, and saw what it was like and, you know, amazed at what was being achieved. And um, and it's just so different to to our day job. You know, I'm sure we'll come on to it a bit, but, you know, there's something like 90 odd monitors and computer screens in the, in the control tower at Heathrow. We've got so many tools to help support us to, to order aircraft in the most efficient sequence possible. Um, whereas at Fairford, it's, a piece of paper, a pen, uh, a radio and a telephone, and that's about it. It's, uh, you know, if you're a pilot, it's the equivalent of going from flying a, a 787 to a to a chipmunk or a, a wow. tiger moth. It's it's the same principle, but it's completely different. Amazing, fabulous. Um, Toby, your, your journey to uh, Fairford is a bit longer. It's about 11,000 miles longer. So tell us about how you swap the, the sunshine of Sydney to the absolute glamour of Gloucestershire. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, and, uh, and thanks for the invite. Um, yeah, like you said, long journey. I've always uh, always had a love for aviation, I guess. Uh, I started out doing a bit of flying, then I went to university, did an aviation degree. Uh, I worked for the Australian ANSP, Air Services Australia. I uh, completed my air traffic training and was sent to Sydney. Uh, so I worked as a controller in Sydney Tower for nearly 10 years. I was very lucky, you know, I've always enjoyed air shows, but part of our ab initio ATC training fell in one of the two years that the Australian International Air Show was held. So we went there as trainee air traffic controllers and were shown around and, uh, and went up the tower. And a little bit like Adam said, it was just blown away uh, comparative to what we were doing in the simulated environment and going to a busy unit, uh, how, how relatively old school uh, air show air traffic control was. 
So uh, out of that, I applied uh, to work as a controller at the Avalon International Air Show in Australia. So I was fortunate enough to work two of those. Uh, and uh, and I think, yeah, Adam Adam really touched on it there. I think the only thing you missed, Adam, was we used binoculars as well. That's about as high tech as it gets, I guess. But um, it is a totally different type of air traffic control to your day job. It's also fantastic because you, you're much more at the coal face, I guess, than you are in a busy, busy tower too. So you, you're really kind of in amongst the action. Quite literally, the tower is so close to the flight line, but also the people you're dealing with. Uh, so I've been at Heathrow since 20. 17, as you said, uh, air traffic controller and a watch manager there. I love it. Oh, goodness. Uh, Adam, you are you're the history expert, and Fairford has got a fair chunk of history with connections to Concorde and the Space Shuttle. So can you tell us a little bit more about the, the airfield where this fantastic air show is based? Yeah, so, so RIAT, um, the Royal International Air Tattoo, and, and formerly um, pre-1990, uh, in the mid-90s, I think it became it became a royal, uh, was given a royal charter. It, it was the International Air Tattoo. It was set up by two ATCOs, actually, right. who, who, who uh, uh, Paul Bowen and Tim Prince, um, who worked for the CAA, the forerunner of NATS, um, and they met at Hearn in the ATC College, where, where certainly AD and I have, have done our initial training courses. Um, and uh, it has been at, at a few different airfields, uh, but obviously the main one is our Air Fairford. It started off at North Weald and then moved to Greenham Common. But um, but yeah, our Air Fairfield, sorry, our Air Fairford was, um, was built in, in World War II. Um, it was used in the D-Day landings for, for paratroop drops um, and Arnhem, uh, you know, the classic film A Bridge Too Far, it was used in the Arnhem drop as well. So, and then it swapped in the Cold War between RAF and, and uh, USAF. And have you, as you say, it was um, convenient for, for Concorde's test development. So Brian Trubshaw, the great test pilot, often flew Concorde out of out of Fairford. Wow. And of course, in the later air shows, uh, later on in, in life, Concorde actually came back a, on a charter flight every air show from, from Heathrow. You could pay to fly from Heathrow to, to Fairford on Concorde, subsonic, unfortunately, wow. and then and then watch the air, for, uh, the air show and then uh, fly back to Heathrow in the evening. Amazing. Amazing. What about the, the space shuttle as well? So there's a, there's a link to the space shuttle. What's that? Yeah, so Fairford was one of four, I believe, uh, European transoceanic abort landing sites for uh, for the wow. space shuttle so there's a very a very small window in terms of time when the space shuttle would launch um that it could land back at fairford and i don't think it was ever the primary abort site um so there was uh, one in spain that was usually may uh, the the uh, the primary abort site but but all the personnel who were designated to to cope with the shuttle launch would all be on alert whenever there right. was a whenever there was a space shuttle launch from uh, Cape Canaveral. Incredible, um, Toby. This is your first year at Riyadh, so you're a trainee at Co there. Um, and other guys have been working hard on the planning and preparation. When does all of that start, and what's involved from an ATC perspective? Well, I don't think it ever really stops, AD. Uh, and uh, I know Adam's put in a lot of work, certainly this year, but uh, it's one of those things, I guess, you, you're continuously working, you're continuously improving what you did last time. There's a very thorough debrief, obviously, and wash up post uh, the previous react. But given it's only a year between events, you know, it's quite busy. And certainly from what I've seen, uh, it, it doesn't stop. I mean, even for my personal training, so uh, I was kind of selected nearly two years ago uh, by, by Adam and the team. Uh, and I've kind of been working since then to just get, Get your head around all the procedures the differences from our day job just learning the, the the sheer quantity of stuff that you need to deal with and a lot of it 80s is, is very procedurally different to what we normally do so from an right. operational perspective for me as a trainee uh, assistant this year and then an air traffic controller next year learning the procedures starts as soon as i knew i was selected so over a year but uh, i guess in terms of the show uh, the volunteers yeah it's, it's almost a perpetual effort oh wow and just just as an aside what what's it like for you being a trainee again again <laughs> Again, again, yeah. Ah, oh, look, I enjoy it, Andy. I enjoy the challenge. You know, it's something like this, like Adam touched on. It's really stimulating. You know, it's really enjoyable. It is so different to what you do. Um, you know, somewhere like Heathrow, particularly, is quite proceduralized. It is very, uh, you know, it's it's certainly not. It, it I think incorrectly is referred to as a sausage factory. I think that's a little harsh on us, to be honest. It is quite varied and it's it's quite high workload, but it's very different. You know, it's a lot more uh, seat in the pants and reactive controlling somewhere like Riyadh. Yeah, absolutely. And Adam, I suppose that there's a lot of excitement around the around the place, not just in air traffic, but the whole Fairford and React community after the cancellations of 2020, 2021 with COVID. Is, is there a real buzz around the place now? Oh, definitely. And and especially given that uh, 2000, sorry, 2021 was going to be the 50th anniversary. So oh, everybody right. was was gearing up for a really fantastic show. 
um and uh, so so the two missing years of of covid have have definitely created a, a bit more of a stimulus on the organizational side to to provide a great show for for the public absolutely yeah so so running up to the actual week itself but before all those incredible displays take place there's something called validation can you tell us just what that is and who runs it who's in charge of all that yeah so so before uh, a display app will display it at React. They will have to be validated by the Flying Control Committee. Now, the Flying Control Committee is made up by uh, made up of very experienced display pilots themselves, who are right. effectively the the safety policemen, for want of a better word, uh, for the the uh, the Air Display Act. And uh, so they have before they display in front of a live crowd at React, a member of the FCC will have to have observed. The display act displaying either at Fairford in a validation or or somewhere else at another air show in the UK or, or in Europe somewhere. Um, and that's very important from a safety point of view. You know, we've got very strict rules about where aircraft can display and and must not display in terms of where the crowd is, the crowd line distance separation from the crowd line, etc. Um, and, uh, and the organization of the air show needs confidence that the pilots will, you know, be safe in what they do uh, to ensure the safety of the crowd. So um, there's a lot of work goes into it in the preparation side. So an aircraft um, that's going to display in the flight display might arrive two days before the weekend, maybe on the Wednesday. And when they arrive, they might fly around for a few minutes, just getting the lie of the land, seeing where the, the visual reference points for their display uh, are. And then they might later on in the day depart again and, and do a practice display or um, or a validation in front of the flying control committee incredible so i mean you've you've got um as, as you you guys know at heathrow you've got lots of different airlines from lots of different countries and and a whole um different makeup of nationalities amongst the air crews but that's civil aviation and and this is military so how, how does that that kind of language barrier is that an issue or does it do you find that it actually it works okay or is it a problem um, I, I think in the main, it's it's OK. Yes, it, as a controller, you need to understand that, that the pilot you're talking to might not know as many words of English as you do, uh, given our advantage of, of native speakers. But but obviously the standardization within the military environment is is very high. NATO has a as has a standard you know, aviation language much as the, the civil aviation um, has a standard phraseology as well. And as civil controllers, we just have to make that conversion sometimes to use military terminology. Um, and it, on the occasions where the language, um, the separation in language is too much to bridge, um, then we will have an interpreter in the, okay. in the control tower. In the past few years, we've had uh, a member of the Ukrainian Air Force uh, stood right. next to us, so, so we'll here we go. Here's uh, Alex from the Ukrainian Air Force. So, so we will instruct Alex. Yep, clear for takeoff, clear for display, clear to land, etc. The executive commands, and then they will relay them to the pilot in the pilot's native wow. language. Incredible. We need that. Need I should just say, if anybody's watching this, coming to the air show this week, none of what we are saying is a clue as to what's appearing. Um, you know, I'm by showing this photo, we're not saying the Ukrainian Air Force is going to do a display. I don't want anybody to build up any hopes. We're talking yeah. generics here. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Toby, the arrival of all of those aircraft must be a logistical nightmare. Um, could you just give us an idea of the process of, of how that all fits together and the involvement of uh, neighbouring ATC units? Yeah, sure. I think you're right, Eddie. I mean, it certainly is, but fortunately it's what we're paid to do, I guess, as air traffic controllers and, and indeed REAT as the organisation on a whole. Uh, is It's a pretty well-oiled machine now. So, you're right. Uh, it, it is an enormous volume of arrivals. There's a very set opening hours uh, during which these aircraft can arrive at Riyadh. So uh, all these these crew or operators will contact Riyadh uh, when they're given a slot time for arrival. So that's basically pre-tactically how we manage the arrival volume. So over the day, you'll get a slot time, let's say 80 of 15.02, uh, which which means your, your landing time is 15.02. So you time your arrival kind of at the zone boundary uh, to meet that time. So when you speak about neighbouring agencies, obviously in the tower, we are only part of this, this pie, aren't we? We only deal with stuff sort of from 10 miles or so, uh, broadly speaking. So uh, outside there, it's administered by the radar unit, which at, at Riyadh is done by RAF Bryce Norton. Okay. Uh, so yeah, they will they will kind of take the inbound aircraft uh, in line with the slot time. So the crew are all briefed to meet this slot time on arrival and we fit them in uh, as well as we can around those 
pre-organized slot times. I guess there's some variables in there, isn't there? You know, missed approaches, weather, all that sort of stuff. Uh, photo aircraft as well. So these aircraft on the way in uh, quite often want to get photographed airborne, which which can add time. So, uh, you know, right. it's managing all those variables, I guess. But broadly speaking, pre-tactically, it's arrived at a slot time. Uh, and then we kind of finesse the traffic within the zone to make that work. Oh, wow. So, um, Adam, just quickly, the, the, the safety of air shows, of course, has got to be paramount. Um, how is how is that managed? Um, how, how do you manage the safety of the event? And, and are there similarities with how that works at Riyadh and the safety culture that you and I might find uh, back at the day job? Yeah, d definitely. The, the safety culture, in my experience, is, is very similar. You know, safety is always the top priority. Um, and uh, and certainly in our in our day job, as, as well as at an air show, there there are things that can go wrong and whether human factor related or, or mechanically related and and we will try and mitigate those in advance you know we'll do lots of hazard analysis activities to try and determine what could go wrong and try and work out the course of action you know if that situation did did arise air shows are, are heavily regulated from a safety point of view and uh, both on the on the civilian side and the military side uh, there are two separate documents but they do sort of sit uh, nicely aligned together and, and and going back to what I was saying earlier about distances from the crowd line how high how fast aircraft are permitted to be at certain points around the airfield when they're doing the, their display and it's 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 an interesting sort of dynamic because while safety is always the priority at an air show we collectively are putting on a show as well yeah, so absolutely. whereas we're not putting on a show during our day jobs correct um you know it's it's all about safe orderly and expeditious in in our sort of day jobs at an air show there's a show aspect to it as well yeah. given its very nature um and we are aware that the crowd will want to see these aircraft doing very dynamic uh, displays and um you know, and, and we want to see them as well for photography purposes. So, um, you know, we do try and accommodate that as, as much as we can um, in terms of, you know, it might be rolling aircraft down to the very end of the runway so the photographers down that end can get a good shot. And right. it's not only the photographers at the other end of the airfield, et cetera. Wow. So, so, so there's, there's, a, a, there's a few more variables than, than working, uh, working in, a, in a civilian airport control tower, just talking to commercial traffic. Yeah, and when you look out the window of the control tower then, so what, what cues have you got as to where the aircraft should be or, or, allowed, to, or allowed to be? And what are the things around the airfield that, that give you an idea as to, well, where, where are they allowed to display? Because when you're in the crowd, you just see this fantastic display and, and clearly that there's a, there's a pathway or a, or a place where that aircraft is permitted to be. How does that work? Yeah, there are certain... Um distances away from the crowd line that aircraft are permitted to be and and at certain points in their display in terms of where their velocity vector so where the aircraft is heading towards not necessarily pointing because obviously fast jets can sometimes um, be pointing in one way and actually traveling in another um, if they're doing uh, aerobatic displays so so that's very heavily regulated and there is a, a line of and at Fairford, we use very bright orange triangles set right. out the other side of the runway from the crowd, and oh, they'll right. be they'll denote the the line that uh, the display line over which aircraft shouldn't cross, and and it's very important when we're talking about air displays that that we have a clear roles and responsibilities. So air traffic control aren't responsible for the safety of the air display. That's the flying control committee. Right. So we, we're working very closely together. They sit just just in front of the control tower in their own little uh, mini tower and we have a hotline with them. So if they do see something that they don't particularly like, so an aircraft might have gone a bit low or been a bit too close, they will tell us uh, what to do about it effectively and right. we will pass that message on to the pilot. Um, because, you know, yeah, I've been sitting in control towers for 25 years looking at aircraft, but I'm not an experienced display pilot. I yeah. cannot tell if something is is right or wrong. I might have a suspicion, but that's not my job to do. Yeah. Um, and uh, so the flying control committee are responsible for the for the safety of the air display. Um, and then then there's somebody called the flying display director who effectively builds the schedule of the display and is the accountable person. So if we have bad weather and and we have to stop flying for 20 minutes, the flying display director then decides what to do about that. 
do we run on 20 minutes into the you know 20 minutes late at the end or do we have to cut out a display act or do we you know they have the decision making so so atc are in that loop but when we're in an air display environment it's atc are very much passing on the decision from somebody else um sort of our forte is as it were is probably more on the arrivals days and departure days when we're responsible for for the safety and and sort of conduct of operations well okay so um you want to go back to um the standard kind of at call mentality toby um give us an idea of the shift timings i mean do you guys get a break is are you, are you rested as as much as you would be if you were back at heathrow um how, how would a normal day at, at fairford work yeah, absolutely, Eddie. I mean, it's very similar, right? So the same fatigue rules apply. Uh, right. I'm sure that we are adequately rested and fit for duty. But I think there's a, you know, there's a really big personal responsibility with something like React because you are, like Adam said, in this really kind of festive show environment. It's like a real festival uh, kind of a vibe, you know, and there's always a lot of other stuff to do. So at Heathrow, uh, you know, I'm not a total prima donna, but there's always somebody else to do all the admin work for you, for you, uh, you know, whereas at React, you, you're doing everything, you know, you're carrying high-vis vests, you're driving right. of water around, you, you're doing a lot of other stuff. So, um, you know, it's not just the actual work in the control tower that, that you need to be mindful of. It's a lot of other stuff, but the same general fatigue rules which regulate our working hours apply. So sort of half an hour, 45 minutes uh, on-ish, up to an hour and a half within a half hour break. Right, okay. So if you're going to be the trainee this year, but you're, you mentioned that you're going to be an assistant yeah. this year. So is, is one of your roles coordinating with the, the guys at Bryce? Correct. So yes. how does that how does that coordination work, and what what kind of things are going on there? Well, the thing is, Eddie, we have no uh, radar facility at Fairfield. Right. Right? So during Riyadh, you literally just have the windows. Uh, so you know you can you can see I've got pretty good eyes. You can see sort of ten miles or so, but some of these really small, fast aircraft are a little hard to spot. And when you're talking an arrival sequence um, of you know ten, fifteen aircraft, and it's quite difficult. And somehow that needs to be given to the to the air controller as a, a mental picture, so they can work out who's coming in next, uh, what the landing sequence is, where all these airplanes are uh, in a three D environment. So Bryce will call the assistant. Uh, and they'll say this aircraft is X number of miles. They'll usually give us a call on the boundary of 40 miles, whichever comes first. So that gives us about a 15 minute heads up. Uh, okay. And then again at about 10 miles. And so we're passing that to the, the aerodrome controller so they can start building that radar picture in their okay. head. Okay, right. Okay. Wow. And 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 what about non-standard events when things don't quite go to plan? So I guess, Adam, you've probably got the experience of things where your, the, your, your spidey senses start kicking in and you, you feel so it's not quite worked out right. How, how does that work and how do you react to rebuild the show? Because the show doesn't just stop. I mean, there's, there, there are other aircraft, as, as Toby said, that are queuing up waiting to come in. So how do you deal with the non-standard stuff? I mean, it, in many ways, it's, it's the same as we do in our day jobs. You know, safety is always the utmost priority. Um, luckily, as, as Toby said, we get the, the the, uh, the our approach radar is provided by uh, RF Bryce Norton and um, they obviously are only nine miles away so so thankfully they are sort of our, our diversion airfield if there is a problem and an aircraft either doesn't want to or can't land at Fairford then usually Bryce, Bryce Norton is an option as well okay. um, and uh, and yeah in many ways it will be handled exactly the same as soon as there's a problem you know, safety is is the ultimate, you know, priority. And if it means we stop for 20 minutes, then we stop for 20 minutes. It's, okay. you know, there's no, there's no question about that really. Yeah, uh, I just want to cut away quickly, Toby. You mentioned at the start about being involved in the um, Australian International Air Show. So tell us a little bit about that. How does that work? And what was your involvement in it? Uh, well, I, I worked as an air traffic controller there, AD, twice, and that was biannually, uh, so it was held every two years, and uh, yeah, it, it was really interesting. It was a slightly different show to Riyadh in that it was civil and military, so it was almost a combination of Farnborough and uh, Riyadh. It ran for a week uh, with trade days the week and then uh, the public days on the weekend, uh, but there was quite a large civil contingent as well, and quite interestingly, there was a temporary aerodrome set up just to the east of the main display line to facilitate people flying in and out too, so that was quite interesting. So there were two temporary towers which were established for that too, so that was a very busy aerodrome in its own right. Uh, but broadly speaking, quite similar, Eddie, and interestingly, many of the people that work at Riyadh or volunteer for Riyadh actually did the same at Avalon. Oh, really? Yeah. Amazing. So you, I've, you, I've, I've heard a story of you standing in a field, Toby. 
Yes, correct, Adam. That was yeah. probably the most exciting moment of my, well, two exciting moments of my air traffic career. So uh, part of Avalon East, which was this temporary parallel runway grass airstrip designed for aircraft, uh, light light category aircraft to land and, and come and watch the show. So uh, similar to Oshkosh, I guess, in, in the US, there were big colored shipping containers. There was a big yellow one and a big pink one. Uh, and as air traffic controllers providing the approach service, we would stand under these containers with the aircraft flying, read the registration numbers, and with a handheld radio, actually give circuit joining instructions and then pass them on to the control tower. So that was quite interesting. I'd love to see him doing that at Heathrow, Toby. I think it could work. I because think it's you, because obviously the, 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 the Emirates has got has got Emirates on the belly, so that, that could catch on. I'm happy to do it. Not in winter. I'll do it in summer only. <laughs> Adam, you mentioned uh, some of the technology in the tower. So are you are you actually telling me that there's there's only a pen, paper, radio, telephone and binoculars. There's nothing else. There's no there's got to be a computer system somewhere that tells you what's going on or, or, yeah, or so, a sequence. So there, there is a, a a computer up there. Actually, we might even have a strip printer this year, which we're wow. all very excited about, as you can see on the uh, on the picture there. Those are some of the uh, departure <laughs> strips. But um, but apart from that, you know, the, there's uh, there's a yeah computer connected to the flight plan system. But in terms of operational equipment, it's it's very sparse, um, which is which is part of the attraction in terms okay, you know, yeah. of that challenge. As as Toby said, you you need you can't just look at a radar like you can at, at most civilian airports and, and see all the aircraft within 50 miles. Absolutely. There's, there's just no screen there, so you have to keep it all in your head, which is the challenge. That's a, that's quite a scan. Yeah, it's heavily heavily window based, I should imagine. Oh, very much so. And and it turns out, that, you know, you can get other people to look for you as well. You know, mm. often there'll be six, seven, eight people in, in the control tower um, at uh, Fairford and and you know you, you you'll call on them say right can you you know i'm trying to look for this one he's out there somewhere um and uh oh, yeah i can see it i can see it well that's it i was gonna i was gonna ask about comparing it with with the day job and i suppose that's one of one of the big things is that not only the technology is different but the relative speeds of these aircraft is obviously completely different to what you're normally used to dealing with so how do you how do you get around that i mean you look over there one second and there's a mig and then he's he's 10 miles over there because he's gone so quick. How does, how does that work out? It's it, yeah, that that is the, the the sort of the second challenge. It's it's building the picture in your head, keeping it and then not applying your current experience from your day job too much to what you're seeing. Right. Um, you know, I, I remember one point, I think it was 2019. Um, there was some there was a C-17 backtracking down the runway. There were four Eurofighter Typhoons just breaking into the circuit. There was a light aircraft holding on left base, a light aircraft holding on right base, and and a KC-135 at 10 miles. And there was a few seconds there. I thought, how on earth is all this going to work? I have no idea. But then you then you just sort of get into it and get stuck in, which or, which is or, you know, or you ask for a break. Well, that, that's that's the other thing. Yeah, you say, oh, I, you know, I need a break now. Um, unfortunately, it didn't happen, so I had to sort it out. But um, you know. And it's that that, you know, somebody who would like that challenge, you know, that's yes. that's who be a good, you know, air show controller. Yeah, just Toby, just continue that that comparison. So, I mean, you, you go from a Heathrow, you're, you're keeping the aeroplanes apart and, and at rear, you're getting them pretty close together. And and the actual job at Heathrow is very, it's very regulated and, and measured um, and, and it, and it Fairfield, I guess it is completely different in that you're you're thinking on your feet. Is it a different skill set, or you're still using those basic air traffic skills that you've got in your back pocket from years ago? Yeah, I think eighty. I mean, that's a really interesting question. I think, like Adam touched on earlier, it's it's probably quite a good analogy. Seven eight seven to a chipmunk or a tiger moth. It, 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 essentially, it's the same kind of stick and rudder basic air traffic skills. Uh, but they are applied quite differently. And I think, Adam, like you touched on there from a human factors standpoint, that's quite interesting, isn't it? That you can't use the same rules of thumb you use in your day job because you get quite good at those. You know, air traffic mm -hmm. control is very largely a pattern recognition based job. Yeah. Once you get really good at it. Uh, 
but these patterns are not quite the same as what you've seen. The speeds are very, very different. The displacement yeah. of aircraft is very different. I think the other thing, Aidy, is it all happens very, very close in, you know, uh, and someone like Heathrow, like you well know, we very seldom manage circuit traffic, that sort of stuff. So that's quite different too. Um, but I think, you know, like Adam said, it's 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 quite enjoyable, you know, and, and you get well trained for it. It's something that uh, I think if it suits your, your personality, it's really rewarding and enjoyable. And so you're kind of attracted to it. If it doesn't, uh, you probably would find it quite stressful, but it's quite different to your day job. The skills are similar, but you apply them very differently. I bet, yeah. So once the show's over, uh, what happens then? Because I guess you got all these aircraft on the ground, everybody goes home uh, and they want to get back to where they came from. So how, how does that work, Adam? Yeah, so so as you say, AD, everybody wants to go pretty quickly. Um, sometimes it might depend on how uh, much they were partying the night before, uh, but uh, but generally they, they all want to disappear as soon as possible on the Monday, which poses a, a, an interesting dilemma for, for ATC and, and the and jobs guys and girls who are who are running the aprons. Um, so the aircraft arrival schedule is generally built around building up the static park of aircraft. So the, the larger aircraft tend to arrive first and the aircraft that are going to be sort of at the far end of the static park. So actually for, for the enthusiast watching, it would be the middle near the control tower. Okay. So you come off the runways at either end and then sort of build the static park up from from the middle of the runway and then building out towards the runway exits. So the first aircraft in generally have to be the last aircraft out. So so you have okay. to break up the static park and depart the ones that are closest to the runway entrances first. So that sort of dictates the, the general uh, order of departure. But there are always lots of variables as there are with arrivals. You know, again, talking generics, not specifically this year, but Farnborough Air Show is going on um, the same week or the, yeah. the following week. Um, so aircraft might want to position to Farnborough. They might okay. have commitments elsewhere. If they come from Europe, they might have to get back because they're doing another display at their home country at some point. So there are lots of different factors we need to build in. Some of them depart as operational military flights. So they'll depart and talk to Swanwick military. So our, um, our military air traffic control colleagues at Swanwick, yeah. some of them will depart and join the airways and they'll talk to civil uh, controllers at Swanwick, Sector 23. Some of them will depart low level and fly VFR and not actually talk to any air traffic control, which they're entitled to do. So it's all that mixing of traffic on departure days that is that that can be can make that day our busiest actually uh, to, to cope with. And then when, I was going to say when it's all done and dusted and the last one's gone. Do you literally just rip everything out and, and then the, it's gone, it's finished? Yeah, yeah, we take take the phone lines out. We take, wow. take the strip printer away, take the pens out, the, the paper mate felt tip pens, which which AD and I will remember from when we had paper strips in at Heathrow. Um, yeah, get uh, dirty fingernails. Um, but um, yeah, it's and and even by lunchtime on the Monday, the air show sort of showground is being broken up and, okay. and dismantled. And actually you come to Monday evening and or even sort of midday on Monday and you've almost feel a little bit depressed that it's oh. all over and you think oh no it's all going we have to wait another year for this now oh, oh fantastic so uh, it sounds an amazing show oh, it's going to be brilliant to watch um we've got a few questions coming as you'd imagine uh, the first one is from graham and this is going to go to toby i think because it's all about being a trainee um he says how much training does a controller need uh, before he or she is deemed able to control air show traffic and how is it achieved in practice? Great question, Graham. Um, well, I think it's two pronged the answer, right? So, so part of it is your experience pre air show, which I think is quite important, you know, and how you build that because it is a very dynamic environment. I think part of that is that real quick thinking ability and being able to think kind of outside the square, which depending on where you work and how experienced you are is, is not something we, we, we encounter frequently. So I think you need quite reasonable experience outside of an air show, uh, but at an air show, you know, the hard bit, Graham, is because these things are quite time limited, you can't train like you train in the normal civil world where somewhere like Heathrow, you have six to 12 months of on the job yeah. training. React lasts a week, right? So you kind of have to get that training in. So there's a lot of theoretical training. Obviously, we do quite a lot of face-to-face -face training before the day, uh, but then at the actual air show, it's sort of three or four days, isn't it? I guess Tuesday, you kind of start and then your validation board, presuming you meet the standard, is on the Friday. So uh, it's it's not all that long, but it, it's quality training. You're always put in the really busy seats. You're making sure that you see the things you need to see. Um, and obviously you need to meet that standard before you go to the check, but it's not all that long. Wow. 
Well, it sounds it sounds grueling but fun. Yeah, good summary. Um, question here from uh, Alan, and this is uh, going to go to to Adam because I think I think uh, you, you you might have seen these guys before. So uh, he says apologies for not sending over the Patrui Swiss jets this year. Uh, already a full year ahead for us here. Uh, but a question would be, if you could choose a perfect place to take a seat on the crowd line, whereabouts would that be? In the centre or off centre at one of the ends? Uh, well, obviously, I'd say the, the best seat is in the control tower, um, <laughs> which which I know is, is, isn't something that most people get to, sit, to get to view it from. And in fact, the control tower is not at crowd centre. So so that crowd line I was talking about the, inside the display line that runs parallel to the crowd. Uh, the center of that, the datum, is actually displaced a few hundred meters west of the control tower. But you do get the odd display who seems display at that will actually display to the control tower and treat it as the center. So we're always very pleased when that happens. We get a great view. Um, in terms of where on the crowd line, I'd recommend, I think it depends on what you want to get out of it. I mean, if you're an avid photographer, you might want to get up really early and get to the front of the, the fence and stake out your spot. But for me personally, I used to be really into aviation photography. I don't do it anymore. I'd rather just watch. Right. I, I got a bit tired of watching air shows through a camera lens and through a viewfinder. Find that I'd rather experience it. So I'm I'm quite happy sat back and anywhere on the crowd line, I think you get a good view of the, the air display when they're up in the air. Um, so I guess it depends a lot on what you're looking for. Awesome. Um, Toby, um, Sue asks, I think I know what the answer is going to be, but what's the impact of such an international flying event on ATC for Heathrow and Gatwick flights, but maybe maybe the wider aviation community, maybe other local airfields or GA traffic? Um, so first of all, commercially, are there any impacts? Um, and then in the GA community in that area, how is that traffic restricted from, from your know, buzzing through the air show? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, good question, Sue, and thanks, Sadie. I mean, there's very little to zero impact uh, on, on commercial traffic, particularly out of somewhere like Heathrow or Gatwick. And that's because Fairford is quite some way away, but also these uh, airshow operations, so we can see them really well, are conducted at quite low levels. So it's very, well, it's, it almost never happens that a Heathrow or Gatwick or, or any commercial aircraft would be down at, at eight and a half thousand feet in, in that area. Um, but yeah, like you said, Andy, general aviation and the smaller airfields within these uh, temporary restricted airspace uh, areas which are established for these air shows, they are affected. Uh, but there's obviously a lot of consultation that happens before. Uh, the affected aerodromes and, and flight corridors, I guess, are kept to an absolute minimum. So, uh, you know, for example, at, at Riyadh, Kemble is, is not all that far to the west and that operates throughout the air show with some restrictions in place, obviously. But, uh, you know, it's part of our job, isn't it? Making sure that all airspace users can access the airspace. We work quite hard to make that happen. And so it's it's ops normal for us. Uh, it's just a different kind of separation or airspace user segregation, I guess, but minimal impact. Too. Yeah, I guess it's in the perfect spot, isn't it, to to do what you need to do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Adam Graham says, um, are there any difficulties encountered with controlling display teams like the Red Arrows uh, as opposed to um, single aircraft displays? I, d I don't think there are any specific difficulties. Obviously, they are different and uh, you need to ensure that you ex the number of aircraft that turn up are what you expect so you know for example red arrows generally they would display with nine aircraft they might actually fly down to fairford with 11. Um, okay. so if you see nine on approach and then you think okay after the ninth the runway is going to be clear oh, okay. you need to keep looking out um, to make sure that you don't miss one. Um, and also, you know, even even with fewer aircraft, it's easy to clear the formation to land and the first two or three land, and then you lose count of how many have actually okay. landed. And, you know, you need to make sure that, again, wow. you know, so from a safety point of view. Um, and, and the other thing to bear in mind is, is obviously each display team will do things differently. You might not be talking to the leader, when you're talking to a display team, you might be talking to to one of the uh, one of the other members of the team. Um, so you might be talking to you know the the ninth aircraft who's at the back of the formation, who's doing the air traffic control communications, and then they'll they'll talk on their sort of internal frequency. Um, with some display teams, certainly I remember the USAF uh, Thunderbirds. You're actually talking to somebody who's on the ground, the other side of the runway, and then oh, they right. do their own 
um, communications internally again. So, so there are lots of different things. It all comes back to human factors, unusual circumstances. Just you need to just be aware of what's going on and trying to keep that mental picture. Incredible. Um, Toby, what uh, what are you most looking forward to seeing? That's from Simon. What aircraft are you most looking forward to seeing during that weekend? Oh, that's tough, Simon. Uh, I'm lucky because I get to see everything. I don't have to choose just one. Probably, I, I love military fast jets just because I work with the exact opposite every day at Heathrow. Uh, and for me as an Australian, I'm, I'm probably looking forward to seeing a typhoon, actually, because I've never seen one fly. Uh, I don't oh, wow. think one has ever made it down to the Southern Hemisphere. So I'm really looking forward to seeing, seeing a typhoon. And what is the typhoon display this year? Is it, is it one or is it a pair? Or? Uh, there's a few, isn't there, Adam, this year? Are we, I'm not sure whether we're allowed to discuss. Oh, okay. It's all a big secret. <laughs> we'll have to go and have a look. Come and find Yeah, out. buy a ticket. Buy a ticket. <laughs> buy a ticket. Um, Adam Keith says, what's the most surprising thing you've dealt with during an air show? Uh, I think he means to do with air traffic control as opposed mm. to anything else that happened. Um, yeah, that's that's an interesting question. I think in in many ways, because it's just so different to our day jobs, I think everything you see at an air show is surprising on on some level. And I know that sounds like a quite a trite response to that question, but but your your whole way of thinking is completely um, sort of one hundred and eighty degrees out. And actually, in in some ways, I found my air show experience very useful when March 2020 came around and traffic and the COVID pandemic hit and the traffic really reduced so much that the situation we were we were faced with at Heathrow and I know lots of other airports was very, very unusual. You know, we didn't have much traffic at all. We were combining positions, three or four different positions onto one controller because there wasn't the traffic. We had aerial surveys flying because the airspace was quiet. We had low level photo surveys flying around. So it, it's almost, in the reverse, the, the air show experience helps you when something unusual happens in your day job. Um, you know, that's a really good sort of experience. I bet, yeah, yeah, I bet it is. Um, Toby, from from your um, a little bit of experience at React, but also in Australia, uh, are there difficulties operating aircraft of such different vintages? So do you do, you, do, you do something different with the, with the older aircraft? Yeah, I think so for sure. Um, and it depends how old you're talking. But, you know, uh, the last air show I worked, there was a, a display of World War One era uh, aircraft wow. that were flying uh, and they were so different to handle, AD, that they actually needed to make a temporary runway, which was orientated into the forecast prevailing winds for the day. Wow. So, right. So little crosswind. Uh, so I think, yeah, there's there's enormous differences, isn't there? I mean, even the speeds in the circuit. So as air traffic controllers, we, we think about speed because that gives us a time essentially that we can use then to work out whether we can fit an aircraft in a gap or not. Uh, and when you've got differences on final approach speeds from 40 knots to 180 knots, you know, uh, it's, yeah, really, really difficult and different. There's also some others, you know, like uh, Second World War era aircraft are not good yeah. at idling on the ground for prolonged periods. The engines overheat, so you can't delay them, you can't hold them. So, yeah, there's very different pressures, but uh, it certainly is different for sure. Incredible. Um, I think this has got to be the last question from Paul, who, who asks the key question, which is, Tell us about Billy the Badger. Uh, so yes, Billy the Badger is the mascot of the React ATC team. It's on it's on our logos. You can see on my on my hoodie there. Oh, yeah. And um, and this is Billy. Oh, there he so is. He's been with us for quite a few years now, uh, wearing a high vis safety the utmost priority as always. Absolutely. And, and he's got um, a security lanyard on there as well. Yes. Yeah. And he's got his own logbook. Um, so he we try and get him flying in some of the display acts um, over the air show. And, uh, you know, just flicking through his logbook, it's, I don't think there's any, even Eric Winkle Brown would struggle to have flown in the variety of types that Billy has flown in. He's been on Concorde, F-22, F-35, Sukhoi 27, MiG-29, Harrier, um, Stop with Camel, you know, all absolutely, you know, everything you can imagine that's ever been to an air show in the UK, he's probably flown it. Wow, it, it sounds like Billy the Badger is all set for the weekend. Well, on that bombshell, I'm afraid that that's all we have time for today. It's been an absolutely fascinating discussion. And I hope that if you are going to an air show this year, it gives you a bit of an insight into the huge amount of teamwork and planning 
that goes into making the whole thing such a massive success. Uh, as ever, if you've got any feedback for us, then please ping us a line at info at nats.co.uk or tweet us at nats. Keep an eye on the social media channels for what we've got coming up next. But for now, from Adam, Toby and myself, it's time to say goodbye. Thank you very much. Goodbye.